In about half an hour, I'm going to set this chessboard on fire. But to fully understand why, come with me. You have to understand the story of this place. And in order to understand that, we have to go back 10 years. So, if you'll allow me. Ugh. This is the University of Northampton, or UON, if you don't have much time, as it was in 2010. It was spread across two campuses, Park and Avenue. This is, was, Avenue. A lot of the buildings were inherited from when it was a college, before it gained university status in 2005, and they were all very much of their age. Which isn't great, but it's okay, because someone came in with a dynamic new plan for a dynamic new university. First character introduction. This is our man, Nicholas Nick Petford. In 2010, he became top dog at Northampton. He's a volcanologist by training, but it seems he's developed a bit of a penchant for management. He was also part of a punk band when he was younger called Straight Jacket, but he left before they released anything more than a demo. Cheers. He defined the next decade at Northampton with his management of the university, and we quickly set a new dynamic pace at UON as he looked to create a fresh new space, Waterside. In November of 2011, proceedings would begin on the construction of the new campus with the firm Savills. They commissioned three reports over the course of two years that would examine the what, where, and most importantly, how much of any new construction project. And the final of these reports would come in May of 2013, and this would act as a key stage gate decision. If the governors read the report and approved it, then Waterside's construction would be inevitable. And remember, this is less than two years after the entire process began. Dynamic. From the minutes of the governors. Action. The Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer to take forward the Waterside development through Phase 2. So, Waterside would be constructed and it would be finished in about 2018 and come to a final cost of £350 million pounds, or £300 million pounds, or £330 million. Pounds. Everyone seems to disagree about that, but. You can finish it if you want. Within less than three years of his arrival, Nick Petford was on track to bring a new campus to the University of Northampton. And that's a pretty impressive feat, a feat which deserves to be celebrated. And the perfect opportunity was just around the corner. Go Saints. It was here, in April of 2014, that the Student Union held their Stallion Sports Awards Night because apparently you can never have too many S's. Nick Petford, Vice-Chancellor, was in attendance, along with Jane Bunce, Director of Student and Academic Services, UON's Best Athletes, and comedian Lee Nelson. If you know who Lee Nelson is, please write in. Either way, it'd be a night of celebrating Northampton's finest. Raising a glass, but sensibly, just the one, to the achievements of the year. At least, that's what was meant to happen.
From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. Crowd surfing is the process in which a person is passed overhead from person to person, often during a concert, transferring the person from one part of the venue to another. The crowd surfer is passed above everyone's heads, with everyone's hands supporting the person's weight. At the Stallion Sports Awards night, Nick Petford crowd surfed. And not only did he crowd surf, Jane Bunce crowd surfed too. We couldn't get the license for the photos, so this'll do. Either way, this incident made national news. Quote, Professor Petford was buying shots for the students and joining in with the Jaeger bombs. He was well up for it and having a great time. I couldn't believe it when he was carried across the room. It's a pretty rock and roll thing to do for a man of his age. Either way, you might expect that a university vice-chancellor crowd surfing at a rugby social might wait waves on social media. And it did, with the hashtag Wolf of Northampton briefly trending. And a lot of tweets under that hashtag, and such tweets more generally, were quite supportive of him. But the weirder thing is that he started replying to some of these tweets. And the weirder thing still is that he retweeted some of these tweets from his main professional account. Adding to this discussion was another voice, the University and Colleges Union at Northampton. They released an open letter just a few days later regarding Nick Petford's behaviour. Behaviour of this type by senior managers undermines the hard work that the majority of staff and students at the university put to creating a welcoming and inclusive environment. Some may think laddish behaviour nothing more than harmless hijinks. However, such behaviour is not victimless. Academic literature is littered with research showing direct correlations between fraternity-style student drinking cultures and complaints of sexual assault. But they're just overhyping it. Just an easy dig at the boss. What kind of truth could there possibly be to that? This is a story that's been told to me in perfect detail by multiple sources. Not long after Nick and Jane's crowd surfing, a student approached a member of staff. That student disclosed that they had been the victim of sexual violence. Were the student to report this incident to the university, Jane Bunce, as head of student and academic services, would oversee that report. The student, after seeing her crowd surfing, would not report to the university the violence that happened against them. They directly linked not reporting to the events of the rugby social. If you'll follow me. You see, the thing about this story is that, again, it somehow gets worse. Neither Nick or Jane commented on the incident at the time, but in 2022, Nick Petford gave an interview to the Times Higher Education, and in that interview, he suggested a slightly different version of events. So, go on, Nick, tell them. It was catastrophically dull, really. The crowd surfing had taken place at about 7 p.m., and it was so tame that the student union had already done a dry run to ensure it all went safely. OK, so let's take that interview as true. In which case, you might imagine, and I do mean might, in my opinion, might, imagine that the following events happened in the days leading up to the 20th of March, 2014. So you're telling me he's going to crowd surf to look like one of the lads? Yes. And he wants to do it early before the crowd get rowdy? Yes. And he wants to test it all now to make sure it's safe? What is hard about this? I don't get why. He doesn't just get pissed, buy the students some shots and do it organically. I mean, he can lie about it in years to come if need be, and it might get him some followers on Twitter. Oh no, that's not safe. 
And can you imagine with the papers? Yeah, fair. Fine, we'll do it this way, make it safe. Right, we ready to run this thing? OK, that interview might provide an alternate narrative to what might seem like the obvious. But why would someone even do this? To shed more insight, here's our next character introduction, Dr. Nick Cartwright. Cartwright, not Petford. Try not to get the two Nicks confused. Either way, here he is speaking in 2022. So the UCU, I think, had, well, was raising concerns about uh, the culture on campus and complaints of or yeah, instances of sexual assaults and whether or not there was a, a culture around that. It was the the NUS at the same time was also publishing its reports around lab culture on campuses and so there was a, a national context in terms of that. The UCU I think was concerned that there was a lack of collection of, of data on this so we didn't really know the size or shape of, of a problem or if there was really a problem. Uh, and there was definitely a, a disinterest in finding out about that from senior managers within the university. Mm. Uh, various conversations where uh, I was told, for example, that there, was, there were concerns around drugs and that yeah, sexual violence wasn't a priority at the university. Uh, quite a lot of us were aware as personal tutors or dealing with students that there was a number of students who were approaching us to discuss uh, things like applying for mitigating circumstances because they were suffering mental health issues relating to uh, what I describe as kind of worrying sexual activity, although not all of those students perhaps saw it as, as criminal activity or as, as sexual assault. I mean, one of the big things that UCU were pushing on was that for there to be a separate uh, reporting mechanism for sexual harassment cases away from the general bullying and harassment policies and procedures. That doesn't seem to have happened. Just to note, it seems that Cartwright is correct and there is no separate student sexual violence policy. And because it always gets worse, it seems that the policy titled Misconduct Policy brackets Bullying, Harassment, Discrimination and Violence close brackets, which is just a general misconduct policy, is sometimes referred to by the different name of Student Sexual Harassment, Misconduct and Violence Policy, when on web pages and freedom of information requests that are already talking about sexual violence. Two names one policy, and it's a general misconduct one. Weird. Anyway, can't write. Uh, for there to be publicised reporting mechanisms, for us to be collecting data, for us to be analysing the data, for us to have uh, rape kits, for example, accessible, and they're the kits that you would give to somebody who perhaps... Uh, well, they're, they're the kits you would give to somebody who reported an incident but didn't want to immediately go to the police, so perhaps they could do evidence collection if they wished to, but also protected their, their right to decide when they wanted to proceed with issues. I've, I've asked at meetings if anybody knows, you know, having been told that those rape kits are available, I've asked how would you go about getting one, and I've yet to be given a, a clear answer. So I don't think any of those things have actually been acted upon. Now, this bit will take some explaining, but it's a rape kit or an early evidence collection kit or an EEK, if you don't have much time, is used to protect evidence in the hours after a sexual assault without involving wider services, police, etc. And I wanted to prove Nick Cartwright wrong on this. So I got in contact with ResLife, the organisation in charge of student welfare on campus, and they didn't have anything, but they referred me to the Sexual Violence Liaison Office, who provided this. As far as I'm aware, the university would not supply these as staff slash SVLO staff are not qualified to use these. Rape kits, that is. However, we would refer people through to the local sexual assault referral centre, SARC. Let me illustrate my initial reaction to this. I'm sorry, not qualified. So you might have had them, but just no one at your sexual violence liaison office would be prepared to use them. So if hypothetically someone got sexually assaulted, while there is a nice face to it, they might be better off with just a phone book. So I asked if they had ever had any, and they said they weren't aware of the university having provision of rape kits in the past. Oh, so they just never had any? And I mean, they are a liaison office. They're not necessarily an all bells and whistles rape crisis centre, nor should they be. But you'd hope that the university wouldn't allegedly mislead 
Nick Cartwright, chair of the UCU at Northampton, into believing that they actually had rape kits. I mean, either that or slightly more humorously, they had some and then lost them. Either way, as demonstrated earlier, it does somehow get worse. 462 rooms with 462 students in St John's Halls of Residence on St John Street, just across from St John's car park. St John's Halls opened in 2014, so students were living here well before the main campus opened. And considering the concerns around lag culture and sexual violence that were happening around that time, you'd hope they'd be careful or at least mindful of the fact that this was a five minute walk away from town. And this equality and diversity document, probably written in 2017, asks a number of questions between the UCU and the university. The UCU asks, do we have any data regarding the experience gained from having students living in the town centre and the impact of town centre's halls of residence? Is there any data to relating to alcohol and drugs, hate crimes, sexual assaults, which can be used to help analyse what is going on? And the union response is, we do not currently have any data regarding this matter. They had no data. I even made it bigger so you could see it. No data, which isn't great, particularly when in a former document, they said that they would gained lots of experience from students living in the town center. But materially, they had nothing, nothing on how that over there would affect student safety, even though they had students living here for three years up to that point. And we've only been talking about sexual violence, but this says they have nothing at all. If only there were a series of interviews with senior management that could explain perhaps why this happened. I'm sure the first project that we've had looking at it, and partly it's driven by the media in general, isn't it? You know, there's a whole bunch. It's almost this sort of, what's that bloke? The Hollywood guy. You know, all the Me Too stuff. There's a whole, there is a kind of media circus. I don't mean that in a nasty way. Around this and it's becoming massively, you know, reportable and so people are sort of holding up a mirror to themselves, which is probably not a bad thing, to be fair, you know. But whether, you know, but what worries me slightly about some of these sort of media-driven things, although there is truth to it, absolutely, people start searching for things that aren't there, you know, so it goes, spills too far in one direction, and you become slightly self-obsessed with an organisation. These comments are taken from a research paper published in 2018, entitled Safe Spaces, Safeguarding Students from Violence and Hate. It's anonymised, but it's very clearly about the University of Northampton. It talks about two old campuses and a new one being opened. It's conducted by lecturers who were at the university. You get the picture. It includes a bunch of testimonials from students, lecturers, and senior management. But, you know, for this we only care about the senior management interviews. And despite some interesting comments about the Me Too movement, it also sheds some light on the seeming lack of investment in sexual violence safety. So. Well, I've seen an increase in mental health issues. I've seen a definite increase there. So at the moment, the university are looking at putting extra resources for staff and students in supporting mental health well-being, because we've seen that. Well, the biggest challenge that we'll have actually will be, probably will be general crime, campus safety, crime safety. I think theft is something that we need to be, of which we need to be cognizant, the risk of theft. It was priorities. A uni strapped for resources trying to allocate what bits of student safety to prioritise, which is, which is fair, but you'd hope that the discussions being had would be between, say, sexual violence support or new office furniture, not between new office furniture or sexual violence support or hate crime or general crime or theft. And judging from these interviews, management didn't even have a clue what to prioritise. But what could be eating so many resources at a time like this? After all, this is just after tuition fees were raised to 9,000 quid a year. <laughs> what possible huge, massive project could be eating so much stuff at a time like this? So, for structure's sake, let's do this weirdly. Waterside Campus would open in 2018, but you can only see its true problems once it's open, and then we'll look at the behind the scenes. 
So in 2022, I spoke to former disabled students officer, Kirsty Pope. Kirsty, being in the future, what problems does Waterside have? Um, the accessibility at Waterside could be a lot better. I was gonna say it could be a lot worse, but I'm not sure how much worse it, it could be, if I'm really honest. Even on the foundations that the floor isn't level, so wheelchairs will potentially go towards the, the water, which isn't, isn't very uh, safe. But also things like the glass doors, yes, I understand that they're fire doors and they're there for a reason and they have to be a certain weight or they have to be. But, you know, you can have push pads, you can have automatic doors that now they're looking at millions of pounds if they want to restructure the building. And in terms of accessibility in a, I guess, a more hidden way, if you think about hot desking, the need for control, for certainty, all of that, if you have someone who's neurodivergent or even just struggles with anxiety, that need isn't being met through something as simple as not being able to have their own desk. Why were they not picking up these things? Why is our campus being put down as accessible? Sometimes, yes, we are meeting the legislation, like the ramp towards the 24 hour access ticks all the boxes, but not when you're the one having to get yourself up that ramp multiple times a day. This, the university talks about inequality. It talks about accessibility without really realizing what those words mean or putting them into practice. We have a Equality and inclusion document, it's its not really performative, it's not really worth the paper it's written on, which isn't just our university, that is across the board. I don't think we can claim to be a fully inclusive or accessible space based on the fact that some students can't access their lectures at times. Somebody signed this building or these buildings off, somebody signed Waterside off and I mean, it's no secret how much it cost. It's, it's been in the papers, it's been in the news, it's been everywhere. And I think I, I do feel slightly sorry for the people who are coming in and who are having to deal with some very unhappy students, some very unhappy staff members. There, are, there is a lot of movement now. There are people making changes and people having, I would say, are the right conversations. But ultimately, we've, we've been here four years. Um, this is a purpose-built campus. It shouldn't really be the case that we're having to discuss or fight for these things. Well, that's not great. But how did we even get in this situation anyway? So it's two parts, right? And the first part is consultation. UON's management were consistently criticised for the lack of it surrounding water size development, at least by the UCU. And the best demonstration of this concern would be the fact that in late 2014, as construction of Waterside was about to begin, the UCU submitted a petition to the senior management team of the UCU for a judicial review. It didn't go ahead. The UCU's management couldn't justify the cost. But here's some highlights that might just illustrate what was going on. So, quote, There have been consultation events, but clearly this is too late, and members are of the view that this is a whitewash. We are also very concerned that the governors are not aware of the strength of feeling around the lack of consultation. And as a branch, we do not feel that they have been discharging their legal obligations. But let's be fair, in May of 2013, the Waterside Project was unveiled to the public. Over the next four-ish years, there'd be about 12 consultation events by my count, and this included forums, drop-in sessions, roundtables, etc. And to spare you running through all the 12 events, Let's play the greatest hits. So, Maestro, if you would. The Claiming the Waterside Conference. Seemingly a conference about putting buildings next to water? And two of the firms speaking at this conference would be firms working on Waterside. December 2013, Waterside, why now? The Vice Chancellor presented the progress of the Waterside project. The UCU notes that that was all it was. No feedback was given regarding any issues raised, and it was hard to raise any issues due to the large size of the venue and seniority of the man at the front. But here's an example that is perhaps most typical of the consultation this document describes. October 2014, 
a month before ground was broken. The management organised the academic building designs update. There were two dates, but these were given at short notice. Plans were presented and a feedback form was provided. The UC states that the questions on this form were leading, with limited space for writing a response. Senior management were not present at either event, and no individual responses to feedback had been given by management by the time of this document's writing. That was a month later. That's probably the most reflective of the general vibe the UCU was noting at this time. Sure, material sent to staff through this period praises the quote, lively, thoughtful and interesting conversation, unquote, surrounding Waterside. But indulge me, one more, just to completely illustrate the, the mania of what was going on. In August of 2014, the UCU circulated a questionnaire to all staff trying to understand how Waterside was viewed. They were then asked to withdraw the survey having breached the staff survey policy. No one at the UCU ever found this policy. In an informal meeting, university management said that they would do a survey as well as focus groups, so it's okay. But go even further, because of all of this perceived mismanagement, in late 2014, the UCU passed a non-binding vote of no confidence in Nick Petford, citing the perceived risky financing of the Waterside project. A Northampton spokesman said, quote, the Waterside campus will be a positive development for students, staff, and the wider community. And all of this happened in two years. Two. Two years. Two years. Yeah. We did have, at the time, a disabled members rep in UCU who used a mobility scooter. And we had a joint consultation and negotiating committee, a JCNC as they're called. Uh, which was chaired by Nick Petford. And we have to provide our reps to attend that meeting. I specifically asked the disabled members rep to come along to the meeting. We invited the equality officer from UCU nationally. She came along. We invited, uh, well, we asked Unison whether or not they wanted to invite somebody. They brought along uh, a regional rep with expertise in, in disability issues because we wanted to bring accessibility up Nick Petford's response was uh, to highlight that no, uh, no, no space is truly accessible, which is, is true, uh, but is not obviously a defence to everything, and to dismiss the disabled rep's uh, experiences as tough luck. And the disabled rep felt afterwards very, very upset, uh, in fact was tearful afterwards, and the the national equality rep was disappointed in the level of response and I certainly interpreted it as a, a lack of, of interest or care in, in inclusion and accessibility. In 2015, the University of Northampton would have the highest debt to income ratio in the UK. That kind of financial pressure does not, cannot lead to full and proper investment. Not in lecturers who've been taking on more and more work as support staff have cut back. Not in creating a masterpiece of accessible architecture, far from it. Not in students who've had their, not in students who've had their safety left in the hands of a bureaucratic check position. Yes, we've got three more equality impact assessments, but these are just screenings. You'd figure that 300 million would perhaps stretch to a full screen, and none of these recommend them. There might be more, but they've eluded me. They've eluded my inside source, and they've eluded a freedom of information request. So as it stands, that's 300 million quid for 15 pages. But this story's still got a few pages left, and I think they're best served by somewhere else. In 2022, Nick Petford resigned.
And I've talked for long enough, and you've watched for long enough. If only there was a way to explain this in, say, a book called The Peter Principle. In every hierarchy, an employee tends to rise to his level of incompetence. That's the whole deal. And let's take an entirely random example from this book, say, uh, the case of our driver. Driver who proves his competence as a student, teacher, department head, assistant principal, and principal, finally becomes assistant superintendent. It's an American book, sorry. Previously, he was interpreting school policy and implementing it effectively, but now he has to help create that policy, requiring a vastly different skill set to the one that brought him all the way up the ladder. He lectures and dominates the board until they no longer consider him competent. He won't rise any higher. They're never going to promote him to superintendent, but he will stay there as an assistant forever. And he'll insist that he's an expert, after all. He's been through the whole system to get where he is now. But through no fault of his own, he's arrived at his level of incompetence, where an employee is unable to do what is expected of them. Mainly by his superiors, but considering our story, I think it's fair to extend that to his subordinates as well. Again, entirely random example. And the beauty of the Peter Principle, as Lawrence J. Peters goes so far to insist, is that it applies to everything, right? You can see this pattern everywhere. You might know someone who's reached their level of incompetence right now. You might be that person. Maybe you should read the book. Sure, it's no Das Kapital, but it's funny, you should read it. And rule number one of the Peter Principle is that the ostensibly meritocratic hierarchy must be preserved. That's how everyone keeps their jobs but also how everyone eventually becomes incompetent. Institutions weighed down by incompetence making decisions for self-preserving goals, all in the interest of keeping their place in the hierarchy. Not that they can ever get any higher, a lot of them. And every bad decision they make in that job that they're kind of unprepared for moves pieces forward, closes off possible positions, possible moves, all until a predictable, inevitable ending. And the hierarchy survives. Forever and ever. And I don't have a good solution for this. That's where the copy of Das Kapital might come more in handy, particularly with the whole education for profit thing. But we've seen how hierarchy, not individual people, can create disconnect between the top and the bottom. How it can enforce the delusions of those who've climbed the pyramid, and how those delusions can have dangerous, stupid, lazy, idiotic effects on the people who feel it the most at the bottom. So with all of that in mind, if there is one solution to this endless game, if you would. <laughs>